What is up, y'all? It's your boy, Yanki, coming at you with a double chapter review for My Hero Academia, chapter 339 and 340, the story of how we all became heroes, part two and three. Now, this has basically just been a nice transitional period. You can kind of tell the, the story of how we all became heroes, parts one and two are kind of written to be almost like with the anime in mind as a this is a good two chapter episode to drop and get things going and to break up in the tone and like give some levity in the middle of a stretch of more intense scenarios and chapters. It mostly seems like Roko should make sure to give his audience a break from all this super serious stuff. And I'm sure, you know, some people would rather not do this. It I also am fully aware that there's some people who actually prefer to see the kids get at least a little bit of what seems like to be kid type interaction. So now one of the things that's worth noting is that there's a moment where they consider the possibility of Hatsume who's come back into the story of being aloof to the world around him. And of course we bring back power loader in the same you know, dynamic that we already had, but we see that one of the main issues that the support course has been dealing with has been Nezu's uh, UA barrier upgrade project. So we know that while we know that he put his own money into it, obviously it seems that he's also made it a point to pull the school into it once he had already had the schematics and stuff drawn up and then having them bring that to life. Uh, so we can see where that's going to go from there. We finally get uh, something important, which is just the fact that the name of the element used for uh, condensed weaponry or like the small like curious flattener and those kind of nanotech uh, weapons is the condenium so we get the idea of an element actually being added to the story so just a bit of actual you know a little extra science being put into the story you know to explain how their world works and how to make does work on the gear for them while she's primarily focused on this uh, schematics of the ua barrier mostly like it's an afterthought uh, it's worth noting that they once again are clarifying that they're not going to have access to um, you know just getting more support items from across the seas all the agencies in general have been a bit of hold up just as a hold even not only just across seas but even locally it seems to be the idea so we're talking about infrastructure really collapsing for what the hero society has been throughout the entire story and what has been presented to us as so with that considered though we do get uh, upgraded Air Force glove mid gauntlet combos. And so what it kind of seems like to me is that the principle of the mid gauntlets has been replicated without the condensing mechanism. So they're not going to be like, like compression gauntlets or they're not necessarily going to be able to shrink away like the mid gauntlets where they're going to be permanent glove sleeves. And that's a fine change. You know, it's not the end of the world and we have the Air Force Gloves, so we're finally getting Deku with optimal gear. This is his final loadout, so to speak. This is kind of like how, if you recall, during the beginning of, you know, the story, we have Deku getting his costume, so he's like figuring out all the things he wants to do. He's kind of drawing it up, but eventually goes ahead and, and you know, reaches out to, um, his mom brings him one, and then after the battle, it gets almost completely modified by the hero course or the uh, hero agencies. And so we're getting that final, just somebody making their own modification to Deku's gear because that's kind of like what they know, plus combining it with one of his ideas for the story. We know that he'll like have his iron souls refurbished. That'll be nothing to replace and standard braces and stuff in his legs. And even if we don't see it on screen, realistically, we can assume that since they said that uh, he was supposed to have mid gauntlets and things like that to make sure his arms and legs are fine during what people like to call the Golden Hunt arc, or what I prefer to call Deku Far From Home, then we can guess that even if we haven't seen it, there's a chance that he also got some adjustment braces for his legs. He did uh, break all of them during the war, so that little bit of extra damage from wear and tear being accommodated, just letting us know in advance that we should be able to see Deku at his full potential because it's worth noting that he did not have access to moves like Delaware Smash Air Force with precision without his gloves. So during the last arc, we saw him using Black Whip well, using all of his other quirks, really training those up, allowing for that arc to focus mostly as a training arc on his new abilities. And now we're gonna get to see him utilizing what he's been training with his full cowling, you know, his basic fighting style in addition to an 
incorporating these new abilities that he's been picked up and working with for the past month and a half, basically doing like an exaggerated uh, training session, similar to what Shigaraki did during My Hero Academia, going off on his own, you know, being away from his mentor, fighting through these struggles, climbing up and trying to get stronger, dealing with these uh, life or death scenario combats, like day, every day to day, not getting any real rest, just like Shigaraki did, except the difference between you know, um, uh, you could look at it as Shigaraki went and conquered an army and then Deku had his own army come fetch him. So that's kind of something you can think of there. So just, but like, you know, getting all this gear said, sorry for that tangent. They're just things that this chapter kind of made me think about with the way this gear and stuff is being set up. And, you know, with once again, having Nina being super concerned and kind of a war work and everybody kind of taking their moments to say how they feel about this Aoyama situation with Shoto highlighting that he's wanted to be a hero and stand next to them you have their supervision license uh, exam interactions that kind of cover and explain that and highlight this stuff so he's been talking about it he's always been trying to stand out in the same way that people from UA do and like the other more successful heroes he's always trying to show off trying to match up to be what he thinks they look like to him how dazzling so to speak how brightly they shine in his eyes now we get you know a cutaway during 339 so that we finally get an update on Nijire, Sun Eater, and Fat Gum that they are alive um, Nijire with a new haircut of course Dobby burned off a good chunk of her hair if you go back and look at the blast that she took from Dobby though it does adjust around her energy bands so she did manage to somewhat protect herself with the energy fields that she keeps at her sides and uses for flight so we get to see that while she did take some damage enough that she could lose her hair she did not take so much damage that she's scarred and crippled forever that's just keeping consistent with the fact that she had some form of protection so now uh, we see that Ryukyu is back in action. That's important to note just because we hadn't known whether or not her arms were completely incapacitated or not. So getting to see that she's still able to be active in the field and even more importantly is still willing to after we've seen other heroes drop out how we saw her feel like she might have been undeserving of that top 10 spot during Pro Hero arc and to see her even after almost losing her hands and all this other stuff sticking around when being hero, heroes aren't even that popular proving that she not only you know cared about whether or not she was worthy of the accolades of the people but she was intent on making sure that she's the kind of person that deserves it validating Ryukyu as one of the true heroes of the story one of those things it's kind of nice to see uh, little internal arcs in like characterization being fleshed out just by circumstance with the world that Horikoshi has set up around her during these times with what we've seen from her introduction so um, we now know that there's supposed to be a plan B with All Might, and then that's when we'll cut over to chapter 340 because we go right into it with them being at Central Hospital. And it's kind of worth noting that a lot of people handling this collaboration are people who aren't going to be running point at the front lines. Like, this kind of seems like there's going to be a bit of like an intelligence network, which that could lead to. Uh, multiple teams need to communicate with each other, but also having those information and structures relayed through a center, which means there's a relay center and a relay point that can now be used as a battleground for the extension of this arc where somebody is likely to attack them at their relay base and where the communications are, where the basically the non-combatants are residing. Then you have uh, what they describe as their goal of divide and conquer with bringing people like Ragdoll back so that she's in on the loop. But this idea that all these characters who have been here are workless or at some level, this is what they will try to contribute to this fight against All for One. And when they talk about trying to make sure they get them at least 10 kilometers apart, I don't know what that specification is for considering it might just be how close All Might needs to be to feel Deku's presence. You know, like uh, we saw that while he was close in, in physical contact with Deku, he was in the vestige world he was capable of accessing or like somewhat feeling something coming from the situation at hand, even though they couldn't have like a proper mental leak. He's assuming that Shigaraki and Alpha One have an even more powerful link and attachment, but also noting that there must be 
some kind of physical proximity where you stop being able to feel each other's presence after one for all. So kind of like a, it, it really is starting to kind of function like a force. Uh, so besides the fact that All Might is dedicating himself to having special doodles of the different characters and the detail with the hands as far as and putting uh, all the little scars on his all for one doodle, which I don't know if that's just him flexing or just trying to be as accurate as possible, but we'll see. And the thing that I like about this is they also emphasize that Dobby is an especially important aspect of them because if he takes up the Vanguard and they are trying to get into range, they were all, his fire itself caused a bunch of destruction. This is kind of them, once again, if you remember, they said, you know, my family faced the flames. Dobby rode upon the back of Yato Machia and just dropped fire all over the place and was just having a good time. So while they were running those 80 kilometers, that's, you know, however many kilometers burned uh, in addition to what the vehicles and all that other stuff that Machia was throwing, just a true disaster. And obviously he would have taken some breaks just to make sure he doesn't completely burn himself out. But it's kind of clear that Dobby was indeed, you know, kind of casually burning down some areas just to make a point. So with that being said, I'm kind of glad that they're talking about how optimistic this is because it does seem like they're relying on nobody getting injured or like these characters holding back and not dropping their biggest attacks and things like that on them early in the conflict. And this kind of reminds me of how in the war arc, they felt like they had the best time and they were running in there and they were, you know, just gonna go in there, get it done. And, you know, Fat Gum just decided that, yeah, sure, Machia isn't gonna move. All these kind of just mistakes that were born purely of what feels like a bit of arrogance, but I also think it's kind of a byproduct of the complacency that they talk about having had built up since the era of All Might and having All Might there to handle so many of the issues for them that it kind of makes sense that they just kind of slacked off after a while and maybe that their plans are a little bold and the reality is is that there's not enough of a reason and i think they're miscalculating the value of aoyama to all for one because we specifically are told and shown all for one effectively saying that aoyama is not a valuable piece oh and even with the you know the speech bubble highlighting shigaraki potentially not being truly as valuable to him as it's been suggested within the story because we have all for one kind of coming through and you know talking about that 100 in lighter fizzling out earlier in the story so this idea that potentially aoyama could end up being harmed or even worse dying here uh in his quest to save and help the out you know the students of 1a because he wishes to go beyond his identity from one all for one and we kind of see that like that's the part that gets clipped out randomly during the the spread between Aizawa and Aoyama talking during chapter 340 about the issues and Aizawa kind of telling him that this is going to be a dangerous situation. You are going to be used as a tool. I can't guarantee that you won't have to go to jail or anything like that. But what I can tell you is that I guarantee that as long as I'm around, I'm going to fight to protect you. And we're going to protect you and that's what we're going to do. And he needs Aoyama to understand that he does not resent him. One of the things that I've seen emphasized and people kind of talk about is that Aoyama and Aizawa are extremely interconnected due to the fact that the large, some of the largest injuries that Eraser ever got in his career were a byproduct of Aoyama revealing their location. And while Aoyama did not, in theory, betray them to all for one during this because he was in Tartarus, and so he hasn't been able to reach out until after he got out of Tartarus, then that lets us know that even though Aoyama is not responsible for it, you can say that these things are linked. Part of what led to Shigaraki building up the reputation that let him get to where he is, is that attack on UA. So him having somebody who's been harmed by his actions, even directly, somebody besides Bakuga, but like a teacher, someone who's an authority figure that uh, he respects, but also is supposed to nurture him because it's worth noting that while um, Aoyama's parents said they cared about him and they were eventually willing to like defend him. They spent a lot of time talking to him about saving them and how they tried their best for him and how they're doing stuff to benefit him and how he has to do it because they won't be safe. Letting Aoyama feel the full weight of that stress 
So Aizawa is here to say that like as your guardian, as your mentor, I'm here to protect you. Uh, we will get past all for one. You do not have to remain under his control. You do not have to be a pawn in this game, even if we are using you. And I'm not necessarily happy about that, but it's the best strategy I can come up with based on the context of your circumstances right now. But the idea of him actually being valued and cared and wanted and not having shame associated with that parental or authority figure support, that is important for this section of story and for Aoyama as a person. The dad Zawa personality really paying massive dividends for this juncture. Because even if we see Aoyama in prison, which we've always wondered, you know, if, uh, if Shinsu was to join Class 1A for real, you know, whose seat is he going to take? Is somebody going to die in the war? And then now you have Aoyama here, who's, you know, this traitor. And we have him being put up to potentially be killed, just being used as a pawn. All for one specifically threatened his family with death. And it's not like All for One is above killing children. He, he isn't. That's just not who he is. So that's just something worth thinking about. All, and Aoyama's been doing the sacrifice play all the way back in, you know, provisional license exam. You could see that as like the big introduction to us finally really getting to know Aoyama and start to experiment and investigate his character since, you know, after All for One got locked up, it's supposed to be when he felt like he could actually be a hero and start to really properly express himself because he was finally able to make friends in his mind so with that being the introduction to him the introduction being a sacrifice play for the better of 1a then we could have Aoyama going out as he was introduced sacrificing himself to help UA and help 1a be heroes now the with Shinso being introduced it seems like we're going to finally get Shinso involved with the story and have Shinso play a role in these upcoming fights it's worth noting that his design has improved he's got his own hero course outfit now he's got an actual ninja vibe going on this is kind of a callback to final exams when shoto called aizawa a ninja for having cow traps uh, got classic spider-man pose shinso not being utilized at events like kamino is one of the biggest memes in the story the same thing kind of applied to aizawa where during the war arc, we get Aizawa kind of mitigating one of the biggest villains with multiple quirks in the world just by looking at him. And the only reason it's being, you know, not game over is because they've been physically modified. And now we kind of see the same payoff here because people are like, man, couldn't Aizawa just look at all for one, shut him down? And, and then it was like, yeah, you're right, audience. Aizawa is that powerful in this context because of the way this verse works. And then. When the audience was asking all these questions about Shinso, we see him coming into the spotlight now, potentially getting to mind control multiple characters where someone like Dobby or potentially someone, you know, uh, like All for One. But the issue with All for One and Shigaraki is that they themselves should not be uh, able to be brainwashed just because they should be able to have some kind of vestige moment similar to Deku. Which is why they use that, because it makes him be brainwashed, but he also sometimes can get out of it just by being in that state of flow, being in and out of consciousness. So that's just something to consider. And one of the last things I did want to mention, though, that people should consider to be a bit worrying is just All Might did not fully know the actual rules of All for One or of Star and Stripes work, because All for One, for example, his name is Shigaraki, actually. We know that he still identifies as that being part of his name because when he gives it to Tomura, when he gives it to Little Tanko, he says, that's my name. So therefore, Star and Stripe saying all for one against him while touching him should not actually work unless you can also use your quirk to identify you because you could say she is touching your quirk factor by coming into physical contact with you. That's about the only justification I could think of for it working that way. And that feels contrived as hell. So, uh yeah let me know what you guys thought of this video just wanted to do this double review uh trying to get back into some swinging things it's been really busy this video is probably not going to be super heavily edited just to kind of make up for the fact that i haven't been able to get stuff out to you guys hope you enjoy the analysis i'm gonna try to make more time and get back to it uh just let me know if you guys have been enjoying the chapters how you've been feeling about the progression of the story and where we're going hope to see you for sunday for the church of mha and maybe on some other one piece videos and 
some other stuff that will be coming down the pipeline, hopefully. Uh, Monarchy, appreciate you all. I love you. And I'm out.